I'm Tracy Nguyen, the project coordinator at CSHA, and I'm pleased to be moderating for this workshop. Before I go ahead and introduce um, our presenters, I do want to mention some housekeeping things. Um, if you go to the right hand side of your screen, you see that chat uh, box and or chat icon and also um, uh, there should be a Q&A icon on your side as well for you to ask any questions and also, you know, you have any thoughts, opinions and any findings you have at your own school, at your own district, at um, whatever site you work at. It'd be great if we have some lively discussion in the chat box as well, but those functions are there for you to communicate with each other as well as the presenters. So I want to highlight that. I also want to make sure that you guys know that we do have our evaluation our surveys that we I will put out for uh, the group. I'll put it out um, in a bit. And I also put it out before the workshop ends. And that's how you're going to get points for gamification um, and also, you know, a chance to um, win one, uh, one of our raffle, a chance to submit um, for a chance to win one of our raffle, which we have a really, really great prize for. I'm sure you guys already know but I will link that in the chat as well. But now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Amir. Morning, everyone. My name is Amir Whitaker, he, him, his. I am a policy attorney, senior policy attorney with the ACLU of Southern California. It's great to be here with you all. I'll pass it to my colleague, Linnea. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, it's wonderful to be here with you and thank you for coming to our session. My name is Linnea Nelson. I use she, her, her pronouns. And uh, I am the uh, senior staff attorney in the Racial and Economic Justice Program at the ACLU of Northern California and also the statewide education equity team lead. Um, we are delighted to be here with you today. And um, Amir, do you want to go ahead and just start? Great. Yep. Starting our screen share right now and folks should be able to see the screen in a few seconds. Perfect. Um, so for those of you who are less familiar with the work of the ACLU, the ACLU of Northern California and the ACLU of Southern California, where Amir work, are affiliates of the National ACLU. We are nonprofit and nonpartisan, and we advance and protect the civil rights and civil liberties enumerated in our Constitution. We know that inequitable enforcement of our laws and policies, as well as the laws and policies themselves, can reinforce systems of oppression, exclusion, and disenfranchisement. We recognize that the educational system in the United States was originally built on a foundation of white supremacy. Intentionally or not, public school education continues to serve the goals of racial oppression and colonization by embedding white supremacist ideologies into the structures and curriculum in schools and perpetuating intergenerational drama, trauma. In late August, the ACLU affiliates across California launched a report, No Police in Schools, a vision for safe and supportive schools in California. The report analyzes data from federal, state, and local sources to conclusively show the harm and discrimination experienced by students as a result of policing in schools. School police contribute to the criminalization of tens of thousands of California students, resulting in them being pushed out of school and into the school to prison pipeline. Next slide, please, Amir. We felt that it was important to ground this report in the history and context of policing in the United States, which is rooted in slave patrols beginning in the early 1700s. Slave patrols were formal squads that enforced laws enslaving black people by violently capturing and punishing any enslaved person who attempted to escape to freedom. After the Civil War, local sheriffs in the South started to function like slave patrols to enforce segregation, black codes, convict leasing laws, and the disenfranchisement of freed black people. School police share similar origins as a tool for the enforcement of white supremacy. In 1948, a security unit designed to patrol schools in newly integrated neighborhoods was the genesis of what would become the Los Angeles School Police Department. Today, several school districts by themselves maintain a school police force with significantly more than 200 officers. For example, in 2016, the Los Angeles School Police Department employed more than 400 police officers. 
There are now more than 40,000 police officers in schools across the country. As a result, during the 2015-16 school year, more than 14 million students in the United States attended schools that have a police officer, but no counselor, nurse, social worker, or psychologist. Critically, police officers are not evenly distributed among all schools. Instead, they are concentrated in schools serving more students of color. This historical context explains why many communities are demanding the complete removal of police from schools to end generations of violence and injustice. And now, now I believe we're going to go to, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, I believe now we're going to launch the poll, our first poll. So the poll is launched. Um, in the meantime, while the poll is launched and while participants um, go ahead and answer the poll question, we do have a question in the chat. Um, and Melissa is asking, wondering if this training offers CEUs um, for LCSW. It's a good question. I've done CEUs um, often. I have a doctorate in educational psychology and can do them. Um, I'm not sure. I think that depends on the, the time frame, um, the time requirements, right? And I don't know the answer to this question either. I think it might need to go to the organizers of the conference. Okay, I will make sure to keep that question and I'll ask my fellow co-workers about that but thank you for your question melissa yeah and i, I think this does um the, the the training this this could be a training considered a training um with the information we're saying both for you know the history but we're also going into practice but also while everyone's completing the poll i want to point out that chart to the bottom right there and that star <clears throat> that shows that red star that shows just you know in 1996 um you know, less than 10% of schools actually had police, right? And then something happened in 1999 that led to this surge in school police when, when the Columbine shooting happened. Um, and now today, over 60% of schools have police. Uh, so just to remind us that just two generations ago in the 1970s, just 1% 1 of schools had police and there were just 200 police nationwide. So we can, we, we often hear people ask, well, how can we have schools without police? All we have to do is just look back what was the norm two generations ago. I do want to mention in the chat that um, unfortunately we don't have CEUs um, being offered at our workshop today. Um, and also we, for some reason, I don't see the polls on my end. Um, is it okay we move forward from this one just because? Mm -hmm. I sure, don't no problem. Sorry about that. Let me try to troubleshoot in the background, but please continue. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Tracy. So um, just talking about some previous publications of the of the California affiliates of the ACLU, um, we have launched several publications in the last several years showing how police and schools and the corresponding lack of school mental health staff harms public school students in California. For example, while funding for police and schools has been on the rise for over the last 20 years, public schools face a critical shortage of counselors, nurses, psychologists, and social workers. The 2019 report Cops and No Counselors documents this trend and discusses the lack of evidence that increased police pre presence in schools improves school safety, the lack of evidence for that. By contrast, data shows that the presence of school-based mental health providers not only improves outcomes for students, but can also improve overall school safety. Our 2016 report, The Right to Remain a Student, reviewed California school districts' policies on school discipline and police on campus and finds that most districts have deficient, vague, or even non-existent policies governing police contact with students. And we can go to the next. All right, and also just lifting up the decades of struggle by youth organizers across our state um, to for counselors, not cops, and to rem remove school police from their campuses. So for over a decade now, the Black Organizing Project has been fighting to eliminate school police in Oakland. Uh, after the 2011 uh, murder of Raheem Brown by Oakland school police, um, 
the organization came together and mobilized and last year was successfully able to remove school police from their campuses. Um, in Los Angeles, Advocates has been working decades down here in SoCal to fight the criminalization of students, um, eliminating truancy programs, random searches, um, pepper spray and, and other forms of criminalization um, in response to student behavior. Uh, and campaigns have to remove school police have been happening all over the state from Fremont to Fresno, Hollister, Long Beach, um, Stockton, Moreno Valley, and, and Kern County and other places. So this is part of a, a larger movement from students and communities standing up to demand what they want in their school. And as of right now, there's actually a, a statewide youth task force that was uh, initiated through, you know, community organizations sending a letter to the governor. Um, and now there's a committee on youth, uh, a youth task force on police free schools uh, that some students from our Youth Liberty Squad are on as well. And then here we have a picture of a petition that our students launched earlier this year that received over 4,000 signatures that was delivered to the governor um, for counselors, not cops and arts, not arrests. And also just lifting up that uh, just two weeks ago, we finished a caravan that started down here in, South, in, in Southern California and Los Angeles, um, because just a few weeks ago, uh, a young student, a, a young person, Mona Rodriguez was murdered by uh, school police in Long Beach. Uh, so we started down here with a vigil for Mona Rodriguez with students from several school student organizations like March for Our Lives, Our Youth Liberty Squad and ACLU, Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard, Students Deserve and other organizations. Uh, we drove to the Central Valley and our second stop was in Fresno, where we met with the Dolores Huerta Foundation um, and had a vigil for both Mona Rodriguez and Raheem Brown. And then we eventually came to Oakland, where we met with Black Organizer Project and others um, and held space for the two young people as well. Because as of right now, I believe in Long Beach, they still have to have extra mental health staff on campus to deal with the fact that you have so many students traumatized from seeing a young person murdered uh, just last month on their campuses and students actually captured the video that is now viral um, of, of the crime. Uh, so at this time now, we'd like to launch the second poll, if possible. Yes, I just launched it and I'm waiting to see the results. So please go ahead and take the next two or three minutes to participate in the poll. Thank you. And the question um, so that we keep our presenters in the loop is, if you work in or with a school, does the school have a regularly assigned law enforcement officer? And Tracy, were we able to, was there, um, were you able to get the results from the first poll um so the first poll i believe we had a 50 out of 50 we had 28 votes um on there so 50 percent said yes 50 percent said no is what um i'm assuming but that should be the result from the first one and i did not um include the other if yes polls just because i couldn't see the result on my end so um if you would like me to enable that after our current poll i can definitely do that for you as well but if you want to keep this poll we can do that too. thank you so much Thank you, Tracy. No problem. Okay, so um, let's see, should we pause or? Uh... Um, so I have the results, there's 22 votes, 60% said yes, 40 said no. Okay, so 60% have yes, that there are police regularly stationed in, their, in the schools that they're working in. Yes, and I okay. would disable the poll now. Okay, thank you so much. No so the our report, no Police in Schools, which launched in August, focuses primarily on three data sets. The United States Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights 2017-18 Civil Rights Data Collection, also known as the CRDC. The second one is the California Racial and Identity Profiling Act, STOPS data set, also known as RIPA, so that's a state data set and then data from local school districts obtained through the California Public Records Act requests. So that was specific requests to, um, to targeted districts. Next slide, please, Amir, thank you. 
The federal data we analyzed, as I mentioned, was from the United States Department of Education, CRDC. And that collects data, that body collects data from virtually every school district in the United States. The most uh, recent data at the time we wrote the report was from the 2017-18 school year. So that's the data that we analyzed. Next slide. What we found is that Black and Native American students and students with disabilities are referred to police at, in all schools at strikingly disproportionate rates. And those disproportionate rates dramatically increase even further at schools that have assigned police officers. So as you can see from this chart, Black and Native American students and disabled students are significantly more likely to be referred to police when compared to the overall average for all students. The likelihood that those students will be referred rises sharply in schools with law enforcement, with Black students being 4.7 times more likely to be referred to police, students with disabilities 4.6 times more likely, Native American students 3.6 times more likely, Latina students 4.4 times more likely, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students at the highest rate 7.4 times more likely to be referred to police in schools with an SRO or a school-based police officer. Next slide, please. Thank you. These stark disproportionalities are revealed in arrest rates as well. So students in all race and disability categories are more likely to be arrested in schools with assigned law enforcement officers. And Black students, again, having the highest arrest rates as compared to students in all other racial or ethnic groups. Looking at Native American students, although the sample size was small, we found that Native American students were 35 times more likely to be arrested when in a school with an assigned law enforcement officer than in a school without an assigned law enforcement officer. So these numbers are striking. Next slide, please. Proponents of school policing attempt to explain the correlation between police and schools and heightened rates of arrests and referrals by arguing that schools with assigned police officers are inherently more dangerous. Baldwin Park Unified School District serves as an instructive counterexample to this assertion. And from 2010 to 2017, the, the district had no police on staff. It then hired six officers in September 2017 and it increased the police force to nine officers in 2019. According to the CRDC, this federal data, the district reported 114 referrals to law enforcement in 2015-16, so just before they hired these police officers. Law enforcement referrals more than doubled to 347 in the 2017-18 year after the district hired the police officers. Interestingly and critically, during that time, arrests actually fell from 70 to 52 suggesting that officers were called for issues in the schools after there were officers, more officers hired, that they were called for issues that did not warrant arrests and should have been handled by school staff. So in February 2021, the school board disbanded the school police department, thereby freeing up hundreds of thousands of dollars to fund classrooms instead of policing in the schools. And to you, Amir. All right, thanks for that, Linnea. And in that case of Baldwin Park provides evidence, right, um, that police actually have a harmful impact on our schools and should the, the funds should be redirected. So our report also looked at what's called the RIPA data or the Racial Identity and Profiling Act. And this is new data that um, the ACLU of, of California was uh, part of the effort to, to get our state to collect last year they did the first public reporting of this data and found for example there were over 10 million stops of, of all law enforcement um with with these 15 agencies that were included so the law was passed in 2015 by you know a dozen over a dozen groups uh, including the aclu uh and there's many school districts actually most school districts um are not reporting ripa data because right now it only applies to some of the largest law enforcement agencies so in this analysis we only looked at the 15 law largest law enforcement agencies and their um, relationship to students and, and schools and those included you know the los angeles county sheriff and lapd san diego police department um, sacramento county sheriff san jose police department and, and others there and the data is collected and reported by each police 
quote unquote stop or interaction with a student um, and they report why this stop was initiated and the outcome of the stop. So we looked at the 15 largest agencies and saw that they stopped over 2,600 students um, ages five through 19 in, in 2019. So and 9% of these stops were children under the ages of 12, 12 or younger. Uh, 26 stops were children under the age of nine. So we have children who, who whose age are in the single digits um, being stopped and searched and interacted with by police. Black students are only 7.6% of the population, but were 26% of these stops. So one out of every five stops uh, was a black student, even though they're you know a, a significantly smaller fraction of students. And students were referred to law enforcement for common behaviors in schools and many trivial and absurd reasons. Uh, some listed there on the right. Uh, so vandalism, sending a false alarm, offensive words in a public place or at school, annoying phone calls, loitering at school. So these are behaviors that are common in all school environments and um, that happen with many students, but we see 26% of the students being stopped for these or search for these are actually black students. Uh, willful disturbance in the school zone, loud or unreasonable noise, gambling, um, and, and other things. Minor attending a, a prize fight, which we still are unsure what that even means. But the chart to the top right shows that the reason for stops uh, vary significantly by race. So black students were the most likely to be stopped for quote unquote reasonable suspicion, which is represented by the orange portion of the the, the bar graphs there. Uh, and you see Latin A students also significantly more likely to be stopped for reasonable suspicion. And we know that's a very subjective and biased thing um, in itself. And you can see for other violations as well, how um, they fell out. Can I interrupt really quick? My sure. apologies. We have questions coming in. I know you want to answer questions as we go along, but um, question from Elena. Elena, are these police officers trained in trauma-informed care is the first question. That is a great and really important question. So from what we've seen and, and heard, we, we know there are trauma-informed care trainings available um, for police officers. It varies largely by districts, but from what we see here, for example, like in Long Beach, what happened last month, it's a different kind of trauma-informed care. So the, the police are the ones actually traumatizing the students um, through their actions. And for many students, students of color, what the research shows is that the police, the presence of police actually trigger um, anxiety and, and other things. So we hope and that, you know, before placing the police on campus, they would receive some sort of trauma-informed care. Um, but we, we know that's not part of the general training for sheriffs and, and others uh, and developmentally appropriate trainings. Uh, Lene, you wanna add anything else in response to that? No, you covered it great. Thank you. All right, Tracy, are there other questions? That yes, was a great there. question. Um, next one is from Katie. Um, did LA establish the first police in schools? That's a great question as well. LA was not the first, they were one of the first in the state of California to do so. But I believe the first, uh, it may have been in Ohio or, um, yeah, they, they established one of the first around that same time in the 1940s when school districts were integrating, they established it in response to uh, control different students. So that's a, a great question as well. But it's, it's important to note that LA, although they have hundreds of officers now, you know, um, it started as a result of school integration and, and the LA school police right now today is larger than the entire nation school police in the 1970s. Thank you for those amazing answers. Um, that's all the questions we have now and I'll let you know if any more pop up. Awesome, thanks. So here we look at some of the results from the stops and we saw that very greatly depending on the race of the students. So staff may call school police for a violation of the ed code or you know, if it's reasonable suspicion in violation of a crime, if, for example, they think they smell marijuana or there could be a weapon, um, that's reasonable suspicion. 
uh, Black and Latin Day students were more likely to be stopped for that suspicion or more likely, in other words, more likely to be seen as suspicious. And Black students received the most harshest, you know, actions after the stops, which is indicated by um, the, the orange color here. So about 20% of Black students were arrested uh, as a result of the stops compared, you know, to 15% of all students. Uh, psychiatric code, you know, Black students are actually less likely, and you see there, Asian students, 37% were most likely to experience psychiatric code, and that's something that needs to be explored as well. Uh, white students were the most likely to receive a referral to the administrator, meaning to be sent to the principal's office as a result of whatever was suspicious or whatever happened. Um, and you can see there, Latin A students were the most likely to receive a citation as a result of the stop. 44% of Latin A students received citations. Uh, other actions during the stop, you see Black students were most likely to be handcuffed. 27% of Black students during these interactions were handcuffed compared to just 16% of students. And going back to trauma, research shows that the, the uh, one study found that the act of just putting handcuffs on a student alone um, contributes to the pr school to prison pipeline and doubles their likelihood of, of dropping out of high school, for example. Um, black students were also most likely to be placed and detained in a patrol car. Um, they were most likely to, to be searched and most likely to have their property seized. Um, I'm sorry, white, Latin A students were most likely to have their property seized and white students were actually most likely to have their property searched and, and black students were um, closely behind them. Uh, so now we have our third poll that we'd like to launch. Uh, Tracy, could we read the, the third poll as well? Yes, of course. The third question is, in what region of California do you work? And then for participants, there should be a polls icon next to your chat icon on the right hand corner, top right hand corner. So if you go to click on polls and you click um, you can answer um, the question there and we'll wait two or three minutes just to get um, people participating. Yeah, thank you. And and we wanted to use this um, question as an opportunity to both find out, you know, where attendees um, work and also because we're going to be talking about some data that we've done a deeper dive into in the Central Valley, which is an area that um, is particularly underserved. And uh, so the first, I know that the first question was, you know, the first poll question was, what was your experience as a student in schools? And it sounded like 60% of people had, had, did have an assigned police officer in their school when they were attending school um, as a student. I, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I'm, I'm in my late 40s and I grew up in Minneapolis public, uh, Minneapolis and attended Minneapolis public schools and, and I wasn't aware of, and I went to a very large high school, I was not aware of any um, police in, in the schools at all. It was not even a, really a subject of conversation. Um, it, there wasn't a presence. It, as Amir mentioned, this was something that really went on the rise in the 90s. And um, and it just kind of got out of control, frankly, um, in many school districts, both in terms of police presence and and also just having a very punitive, what they call quote unquote zero tolerance response to student misbehavior, which is um, just you know, completely inappropriate. And as Amir said, there's studies that show that that kind of a punitive response has long lasting lifetime repercussions on on kids. Um, and so I'm interested that, you know, 50% of, of people of attendees who uh, responded to this poll um, work, work in only 50% work in schools where there are school police. And I think that there's it's more likely that you're going to have school police in more urban areas as opposed to rural areas. So um, so I'm interested to see how this how this poll comes out as well and how many folks are working in Central Valley schools, which is where we're going to go to next with the presentation. Still waiting on poll results. If we can just take like another minute or so, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. of course. And, and actually, this time, um, going back to this slide, you know, I want to underscore this. Um, here we go. Sorry about that. The reasonable suspicion issue, um, which all students are, you know, that's th that's the primary cause for law enforcement interaction with most students. 
and just a reminder the reasonable suspicion itself you know um there were some cases once some argue by the aclu that go up to the supreme court level like with reasonable suspicion or stop and frisk for example being used um in an unconstitutional way to search in new york it was being done by to tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people and it's happens here as well so this is a part of that it's stop and frisk your backpack it's stop and frisk your student um and most the result of most of these interactions is no arrest nothing no violation of law so th that's one of the reasons why we think these interactions shouldn't be happening in the first place okay perfect we have our poll results 27 people voted um, from the four far knowers there's zero um, northwest 18 central valley 18 sierra four eastern sierra zero bay area 33 central coast four and southland uh, 22 san diego and imperial zero okay thank you so we we do have a strong presence of folks from the central valley which is um which is great so um so i'll i'll jump into that now so we've had some long-standing advocacy in um stockton unified school district and in that context we submitted a series of public record act records act requests over um, several years, there was probably three or four PRA requests from about 2011 until 2021, until 20, sorry, 2020. Um, so the report highlights data, comprehensive data on school discipline and policing that we obtained through those PRA or Public Records Act requests. We've been working in Stockton with the Stockton Education Equity Coalition or SEEK for the last decade and um, that coalition has been advocating to challenge systems of education inequity in Stockton Unified Schools and to eliminate school practices that push black and brown students out of schools. Stockton USD is representative in, in many ways of the Central Valley and urban areas in the Central Valley, has just over 35,000 students making it one of the largest school districts in the Central Valley. And a majority of the uh, students in the school district identify as Latina at 67% and Black at um, 10%. Um, and, and about 350 students in um, Stockton Unified identify as Native American. Um, just highlighting a little bit of the advocacy of SEEK, the coalition through the ACLU was forced to sue the district in 2016 to obtain, obtain data related to school policing. So they didn't want to give it up. They had given it up to us in 2011 and saw uh, that we highlighted and, and had some public education about the impact of school policing and they didn't want to give it up again in 2016. Um, so we had to sue them and the data we received in settlement of that lawsuit showed egregious racial disproportionalities in suspensions and school police contact with students. So from July 2012 through November 2016, black students were over three times more likely than every other student group in the district to be arrested or cited for the vague offense of disturbing the peace, which frankly, I don't even know what that means when you're talking about students and youth. What is disturbing the peace? I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. They are constantly disturbing the peace. and. Teenagers, you know, are the same. Um, so what what are we doing where school staff and school police are arresting and citing students for disturbing the peace? Um, and again, this just egregious racial disproportionalities in that in that in that context. So um, going to the next slide. Uh, yeah, right. Findings. Thank you. Um, so actually. Amir, I think there's a previous slide on this, on uh, suspensions. Yeah, yeah there we go. Suspensions. No problem. So um, so we again asked for the data in 2020 and did analysis of that and found that just in the last few years, there are continuing severe racial disproportionalities. Um, in Stockton Unified. So um, we were lucky enough to have the Social Movement Support Lab do data analysis for us. And they found that from 2015 to 2019, black students were consistently suspended. So suspensions are the orange bar in this graph at two to two and a half times their rate of enrollment. Enrollment is the dark green bar. So again, black students were suspended at two to two and a half times their rate of enrollment. During that same period, black students were also expelled so expulsions of the light green bar at rates three and a half to four and a half times their rate of enrollment in the district. 
going to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then talking about school police contact. So um, this, the data found that, uh, sorry, Native American students were booked or cited by Stockton Unified Police at five times their rate of enrollment. Um, and black students were booked or cited at nearly three times their rate of enrollment. In 2019, black students were six and a half times more likely and Native American students were over three times more likely than white students to be booked or cited by Stockton Unified Police. We also found that Stockton Unified has been relying on police to visit students' homes during the pandemic. In fact, all school requests for Stockton Unified Police assistance from April to June 2020 were for welfare checks. Um, that is to check on the welfare of children, despite police being some of the least qualified and trained on the welfare of children. So from July to September 2020, 66% of school requests for Stockton Unified Police assistance were for quote unquote welfare checks. And again, this is Stockton Unified has its own police department. So this is not the Stockton Police Department. This is the Stockton Unified Police Department. The school district is spending millions of dollars a year for um, it's for this police department. Other districts have, you know, obviously, hopefully the districts that you work in have much more appropriately used mental health professionals to check on students during the pandemic. Right. And unfortunately, we've heard of this issue with police being used um, for welfare checks all throughout the pandemic, all over the state. And we want to question that, you know, what kind of assumption does the district hold for students to send a police officer to check on the welfare? Right. What are you assuming? Because what the skills and the training of a police officer and the, the pepper spray and the handcuffs and ability to detain, um, as opposed to, you know, a social worker, or a school counselor, you know, a school psychologist or someone else, or even even teachers or extra staff. And important to mention in Oakland, once the school police were eliminated last year, they now I believe they converted the, the vehicles that used to be used by the school police. They converted those and to vehicles for the staff to use for welfare checks. Yeah, thank you, Omer. Really important context. Um, talking more about this, um, looking, we decided to dig a little deeper here in, in Stockton Unified into this issue and found that in 2020, 79% of school requests for police assistance were resolved with no further police action, probably because a majority of those calls were for police to conduct a quote unquote welfare check. Um, so again, it just goes to what appears to be just a, a massive misuse of police and, and having them do, you know, um, these checking on the welfare of students supposedly, and, and there's no underlying, you know, there's no way that, that any of this is, is any kind of can be categorized as an offense because there's just no further police action. With the election of a more conservative school, uh, sorry, with the election of a more conservative school board last year, um, the coalition is now in a movement building phase to dismantle the culture and practice of school policing and to build a more liberatory education system for Stockton students. SEEK has also developed recommendations over the course of years of advocacy, which are included in the report and which I encourage everyone to, uh, to read. And then moving on to the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Amir. So just um, this is, you know, a more uh, a, a taking a, a broader view of this of the Central Valley more broadly. So after the No Police in Schools report was launched, Amir took a closer look at the federal and state data covering nine Central Valley counties. So this isn't included in the report, but it's very important data. Um, so it covers nine Central Valley counties and found that most School districts um, in those nine counties are, have far more police than social workers in their schools. And additionally, in several districts, Black and Indigenous students are far more likely to be referred to police, including, um, so just highlighting some of those school districts right here, I'm going to call them out, Hanford Joint Union High School District, where Black students are nearly three times more likely to be referred to law enforcement. Lemoore Union High School District, where Native American students are twice as likely and Black students are nearly four times as likely to be referred to police as compared to the district-wide average. 
Delano Joint Union High School District, black students were over six times more likely to be referred to police, six times more likely. And then in Dos Palos Oro Loma Joint Union, black and Native American students were over four to five times more likely to re be referred to law enforcement. So this is a trend and a pattern and a major problem that we see in school districts across California and especially in the Central Valley. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about um, data from surveys collect completed by 1,200 students from over 50 school districts in 25 counties across California in April 2020 and April 2021. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this, I got messed up here. This is about the LAUSD survey results. Okay, apologies. Let me just take a moment. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this is about LAUSD survey. So in May 2020, building on decades of power building and campaigns in Los Angeles that Amir mentioned from local grassroots organizations, a broad coalition of youth, parent, and Black-led organizations, including Students Deserve, Black Lives Matter, Brother Son Selves Coalition, Cadre, Youth Justice Coalition, the Labor Community Strategy Center, with support from public counsel and the ACLU of Southern California, ran a campaign that reduced the LASPD to the Los Angeles School Police Department budget by 25 million, or roughly 30%. The coalition vowed to continue its campaign until LASPD is completely defunded and eliminated. In connection with that campaign, Students Deserve conducted a survey of 5,730 students about their experiences with and feelings towards the um, LASPD. And um, so I believe, um, Amir, should I just go ahead with this one? Yeah, I'll just share, I'm sorry, um, a little bit. So the survey found, you know, students overwhelmingly wanted the funds to be reallocated for psychiatric social workers. You know, over 80% of students agreed. Um, college counselors as well, smaller class sizes. Uh, so thousands of students, you know, supported the defunding of the school police into more evidence-based support roles. And the graphic to the right is a word cloud that represents what the students uh, requested as well. And the size of the word demonstrates its popularity. So you see arts, you know, meals, teachers, help, field trips, sports, campus, you know, other things, PSAs, um, music, and, and different things. So the students have the imagination if, if our school board officials don't. And I'm so sorry that I, <laughs> I got a little confused with this, with the order of the slides. Um, I can go ahead with this for this one over here. So this this slide actually talks about the, the survey that I started to talk about earlier, showing data um, from surveys completed by 1,200 students from over 50 school districts in 25 counties across California in April 2020 and April 2021 about the state of student wellness. That data shows that students are facing high levels of stress and trauma, which is something that we probably all know and recognize, and that they need mental health resources rather than policing in their schools. 31% of students experience the loss of a loved one, and that number has undoubtedly risen from the time the survey was taken, given the continuing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet a majority of students reported having no access to a counselor or therapist in the past year and a decrease in mental health support at their schools in the last in the over the past year and i know a lot of you with the school-based health alliance and your roles and capacities with schools are seeing this directly and we've seen this um with our clients for example students who have mental health or behavioral health needs be responded to by police officers uh, in riverside county we sued the, the county two years ago when one of our students literally was grieving lost their grandmother and the school had no social worker uh, and they responded by placing the student on probation. They responded with a referral to law enforcement. Uh, so we, in, last year in 2020, did the survey, our first um, student wellness survey with over 600 students, and then replicated that survey again this year. And uh, we have the fact sheet available in the link that's also included in this presentation that you can access. Um, and the full report will be coming out later this year. 
but we want to share some of the student quotes uh, from the survey. We asked the students about the impact of the pandemic um, on their mental wellness and their academic success. One student in Los Angeles said, I saw my mom almost dying and haven't had the time to heal because of school grades, homework, testing, studying. I'm doing all of this just to be able to get into a good college, but I haven't taken the time to heal. My mother is doing better, but it was something traumatic. So there goes that word trauma again, you know, and healing is really important. We know our students haven't had time to heal. First, it's not even over. We're not through this yet. So we're still dealing with the grief of it. Um, but students are expected, you know, to to reintegrate into their school environment. And we know schools are seeing different behavioral problems and mental health issues as a result of students not having the chance to heal yet. A student in Imperial County said, you know, I've lost all motivation this year. School ends in two months and I've not learned a single thing. Uh, another student in Carlsbad said, I'm mentally exhausted from COVID, how COVID has impacted Asian Americans. My family and I are scared to go out in public. So that shows how, you know, the issues of racial injustice um, compound with these issues of, you know, the pandemic and, and mental health and provide more of a reason for, you know, school-based mental health, but also ethnic studies and other uh, remedies to, to allow students to be seen in schools. Another student in San Diego said, I feel as if teachers don't take into consideration that our mental health, um, that our mental health matters, and they act as if the pandem this pandemic isn't hurting us. One teacher of mine said that even though we are in the pandemic, she's expecting us to uphold a standard that some students could not reach. She doesn't take into consideration how we feel. So that lack of empathy being experienced there uh, by one student. So um, we also asked students to rate their mental wellness in the poll, uh, in, in the survey. Uh, we asked them to do this both years. And we also asked them last year when we administered it to, to rate their mental wellness pre-pandemic. And we gave a, a definition of mental wellness um, and use mental wellness instead of mental health for stigma reasons and others. But pre-pandemic, almost 70% of students rated their wellness at a seven or above. Last year, that dropped to 27%. Only 27% of students rated seven or above. And then this year, that jumped back up a little bit to 42%, uh, but that's still less than half of students rating 7% or above. 24% of students rated, only 24% of students rated their wellness at a five or below pre-pandemic, um, as a result of the pandemic, that almost doubled to 46%, or almost half of students saying that they're at a five or below. And then even now, so that was when we asked last year, but even when we asked this year, that rate is still at 44%, or almost half of students still feel that they're at 5% or below. And then the lowest uh, part of the scale, the lowest part of the spectrum, 8% of students selected three or below out of 10. So this is, you know, this is near emergency. This is near crisis for the student. So 8% pre-pandemic. And last year that jumped to 23%. And thankfully this year that fell a little bit to 16, just 16% of students selecting 3% three or below. But that's still an alarming number. That's still twice the pre-pandemic levels. Um, and that's still an emergency for one out of every seven students. So we also asked students in the past year, where did you get help from, um, you know, a counselor or therapist in, in, in 2020, 2021? 57% um, of students said nowhere, they didn't receive help. Uh, about 14% of students said they received help from a counselor or therapist that was not at school and 12% said at school. Oh, and it's important to mention that we did this study, um, this report in, partnership with the California Association of School Counselors and also the Center to Close the Opportunity Gap um, at Cal State University, Long Beach. All right, so here we wanna share a video um, of our students talking about mental health. Students in our Youth Liberty Squad who um, have been active in fighting for mental health as a civil right. And we asked them, you know, in relation to counselors, Instead of cops, we asked them, why is mental wellness, why is mental health important? Um, just a few weeks ago, we want to share this video with you all. Speculate now. And why do we need to prioritize student wellness? Any, anybody want to speak on that? 
We have to prioritize student wellness because because anxiety, stress, panic, overwhelming things can overcome our body, and sometimes we don't really know how to get out of that feeling, which can not only mentally harm our um, our performance in school, but our life overall. Yes, Amanda, thank you. Anxiety, you type it in the chat. Myself, Udine, or Brutus will read it. I think school-based mental health is a civil right because students are people. Ooh. Wrap up with... Um, I was like, wait, no, I have announcements. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, have a, I have a comment. So, All right. um, I like... I don't have the phone with me. I just kind of, I kind of have like the first line. So it's kind of goes like prioritize student awareness because I didn't know I was a counselor until I had to seek help. And so like, I just wanted to ask, did, um, I said school-based mental health is a civil right because it means we're not alone. Sometimes it feels like we're surrounded by our anxiety and worry and there's no way out. And even though everything could be falling apart, friendships, families, home lives, we still have to do our English homework. And even if we can barely keep our eyes open with the load of work we have to bear every day, we still have to push through calculus. And even if the world is burning and we may not have a possible future, we still have to go to class every day. Or something like that. Woo, Lily! How'd you do that in like three minutes, girl? Like, how don't you, are you like, is there a twin somewhere doing that? And Millie did a brilliant, beautiful piece um, at the rally she organized against Asian hate back in, was it May? Um, it was a fire poem, so you should perform that one day for us, Millie. Amir, there's one more I can read out of the song. Please, um, please, I think it's two. Yeah. Two. All right, so school-based mental health is a civil right because health is a civil right. We as humans have the right to ourselves, our bodies, our minds. We were born not to be deprived of our vitality through the heartless machinery of academic institutions, manufacturing cookie cutter workers on the K-12 assembly line, disposing those apparent defects onto pipelines and sidelines. We were born to live, to thrive. Ooh, I got you. Whoa! Snaps for song. So we wanted to just make sure to bring some student voices into this. Um, and that again, that's our Youth Liberty Squad who who uh, we meet with twice a month, students from over 25 schools down here in Southern California. Uh, so you can access the State of Student Wellness fact sheet here at aclucalaction.org slash SW. Um, and it has more details and more findings from that. And again, relating that to school police because we see police being used in schools to respond to students' mental and behavioral health issues. Uh, and um, our student, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, just to cut in before you move on to the next slide, we do have a question and there's a lot of approvals and like a lot of people really appreciate the video. They really loved it. So shout out to the amazing youth who participated in that. But um, the question is, do you think there is a way the school system can help incorporate mental health without sacrificing their grades slash standards? Absolutely. There are many ways. Ap there are many evidence-based ways that students, uh, that schools can do that and, and they have to do that. You know, uh, our report, we actually asked students, what are some of the ways that, uh, that schools can prioritize mental health? And they came up with ideas, you know, like weekly check-ins and different things that we'll talk about in our full report. Uh, but we understand that there's a balance, right? There's academic accountability, um, you know, with college preparation and different things. But the purpose of schools is not just to create a test score, it's to create citizens. And I think all school campuses should really be prioritizing social emotional wellness now. And you've seen that in some districts where they've made that explicit, but we need to be explicit and say, okay, academics are important, but we also are prioritizing social emotional health, mental health, um, and wellness and th that that has to happen at the school level that has to happen at the district level and then then there has to be understanding of like okay so maybe in homeroom you know we create times for check-ins or in lunchtime we create buddies and, the, and then this the systems and the culture can then follow but i think there has to be that declaration that social emotional wellness that mental health 
is just as important or just as a priority as the academic. And I totally agree with what Amir just said. And, and also just say that, wanted to say that it's, it's actually critical for academics, for students to have that social emotional learning. Like that is, they can't, they can't really focus and be able to be present and, and be as, you know, academically achieving as they can be unless they have that, um, that social emotional aspect that is being addressed for them. It's a prerequisite, right? It's, it's a need that has to be addressed before learning can happen. And that reminds me, actually, we had another poll, um, I think, that we can launch at this time. And my apologies, but poll number five, could we launch that poll? Yes, of course. Before I launch, I do want to ask you, um, poll number five, if you wanted to ask the question, do you know school administrators would like to have more discretion under the law, not to not notify law enforcement about student misbehavior in school? Is it that question? Because that's number five on my end. No, sorry. It's uh, it's the f number four. Uh, okay, it's, perfect. Do you, do you support? Yes. I'll enable it right now. I just wanted to make sure on your end. Thank you for the clarification. And it has been launched. So participants, if you can just go to the Q, or not the Q&A, uh, go to the polls icon on the top right hand corner so that you can participate. That'd be awesome. Um, we'll wait two or three minutes for you guys to participate in the meantime. And this quiz question is about people's support for police free schools. Um, and, and I'll say that, you know, the work that we've been doing in Stockton and, and many other places, um, especially in more in areas that are sort of more traditionally conservative, it's there's, you know, there's a process of public education. People aren't aware of a lot of the data that we're talking about today. And so having that conversation is really a first a, a place to, to start with people. So there is no, you know, the intention with this poll is really to sort of better understand how, you know, how people are feeling in this moment about this. This is a, this is a poll that we actually, you know, ran for um, the Stockton Coalition um, of other groups that wanted to work with SEEK, with the Stockton Education Equity Coalition in Stockton, who are interested in doing education equity. And we just, you know, wanted to really better understand people's actual feelings about um, whether or not they were equating police with safety, because I think that that is a very prevalent public narrative that is unfortunately really, you know, not based in fact, in reality. And so it's important for us to get a feeling and understand how much do we need to be having these conversations to really raise up the data and and just, you know, the sort of the the, the reality of the situation. Right. I mean, just think, unfortunately, the most recent school shooting in California, you know, was was a school police shooting, you know, a teenager. So we know school police are often used to prevent school shootings, but we don't think, of, you know, here in our most recent memory, um, they were the school shooting. They were the, the people traumatizing. And that's why our students, you know, last year um, sent this letter to Governor Newsom, Superintendent Thurman, you know, Surgeon General Dr. Nadine Burke uh, and others um, demanding that they prioritize student mental wealth, student mental health, um, wellness, you know, um, in the funding and different things. And luckily, we've seen a lot, lots of increased funds for mental health, student wellness since then. But they also asked the governor to do more um, to remove police from school specifically as well. And, and this was uh, something signed on by, you know, lots of different organizations from the California School Nurse Association, the California Association of School Psychologists, um, the Dolores Hertha Foundation, uh, you know, lots of partners all across the state and students themselves uh, from over 35 schools. And this was something led by our students uh, as well. But before we discuss this more, um, could we share the poll results if they're if they're ready? Yes, of course. So again, the question is, do you support police free schools? And we had 24 votes came in, 70% said yes, 4% said no, 20% not sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone for sharing. Thank you for that honesty. We, we definitely understand, you know, in, in some schools, they've done work to integrate um, school police with the mental health staff as well. And, you know, they have teams of police and social workers, for example, and different things and we've seen different models that attempt to, to do that our preference is always just 
for uh, the mental health professionals, the wellness, and, and others that are trained to prioritize uh, student needs. Um, here, just showing one of our students, Sonia, who is a student in, in San Francisco, who said she was one of the students. She said, I, I was one of the students to initially draft a petition to support counselors, not cops, and arts, not arrests, and eventually became one of the students to speak um, to state officials. So uh, as a result of student advocacy, we were able to meet with you know, the State Board of Education, the California Senate, the California Assembly, you know, representatives, uh, and and the California Department of Education and others to advocate for student mental health and wellness um, and counselors, not cops. And there was also, before I go into the recommendations and wrap up here, one of our students, um, Anthony, was able to testify last year in the California legislature about this issue. And I have a short video we'll share. Um, and what, what Anthony shared was not only the results of our student wellness fact sheet, but also, you know, why uh, the, the state officials have to do better to prioritize counselors and mental health instead of cops. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you for this important opportunity. I'm here representing not only the American Civil Liberties Union of California, but countless students statewide. Today, I want to highlight one concern that has only been exacerbated by COVID-19, student mental health. Students across California are currently navigating ways of dealing with a global health pandemic unlike anything they have ever faced before. While some students are tired of having to fight for the only counselor that must attend to over 100 students every week. To solve this, school districts statewide should replace police officers with school counselors, psychologists, and nurses. Because today is youth, has supported the Black Lives Matter movement in record numbers because of how important police brutality is to us. Allowing police officers on our school campuses will not only make some students afraid of attending school, but also cause unnecessary stress and worry to the school environment. After all, our schools are a community lifeline. By providing a safe environment with more mental health services and less policing, we will be able to build the foundation from which all students can recover from this pandemic and adequately succeed. Thank you. My name is Christian Wimber, and I'm a youth leader. All right. So again, just wanted to bring the student voice back into the space before we uh, wrap up and conclude and open it up for more questions. So um, the recommendation, you know, of our report and also the the recommendation from different frameworks across the state of California is, you know, no schools in California should have a permanent police officer. Specifically, you know, LEA should should not be able to create their own police department or reserve forces, nor should they be able to coordinate with any outside law enforcement agency to station law enforcement permanently on school campuses. Our, our vision of a school should not include a law enforcement officers. You know, school staff should never call the police to campus um, unless there is an immediate threat of, of danger or serious physical harm, uh, serious injury um, to a person or property. And schools should not replace. Sorry, not or no on property. <laughs> Sorry, on <laughs> to property. A person. Yeah. yeah, very important distinction. And Lene, you want to take the last two bullets? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So another thing that we noticed, particularly during the pandemic, is that um, is that there's been a heightened um, use of surveillance and other, you know, sort of school hardening measures that have been taken by school districts. So we can see this, unfortunately, with um, it's like essentially with spyware that's installed in um, student uh, computers, student school computers, that something called gaggle that was you that is used by some school districts to monitor students, um, like even, you know, their Google searches or what they're typing in in chats. Um, which can be really, really harmful. There was a, a story about a, a student who I believe was, you know, was LGBTQ and was just trying to find out more information in junior high. And um, that information ended up being shared. And I, I believe that like school staff called the student out on it. And um, it was, you know, it's really harmful to students with mental health to have that, that kind of response and, and surveillance of them. And then um, I dropped a link into the chat of the Dignity in Schools California Framework, um, which is uh, you know an important co statewide coalition that has developed recommendations for how schools, sh what schools should do in terms of divesting from police and investing in supports for students. 
Thanks for having okay. me. Just a quick 10 minute warning, but it seems like we're on schedule, so good to go. Awesome. So we'll drop the link to this entire presentation in the chat as well. But um, the call to action, you know, you can read the full report. And we have that link there for the No Police in Schools report. But also we have links to support local campaigns for the fight to get police out of schools in Los Angeles, um, in Pomona, in Central Valley. There's a coalition called the Central Valley Movement Building Coalition um, in Stockton, in Oakland, and also in the Antelope Valley. And these are just some of the campaigns that are happening across the state, uh, but we know there are others. And then also support for AB 610, which is current legislation uh, in California that attempts to eliminate some of the mandatory notifications to law enforcement that schools are required to do. Lene mentioned the term zero tolerance earlier, and this is a law that attempts to undo some of the zero tolerance laws that require um, automatic you know, notification of law enforcement for things, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or different things that could be handled at the school site level where the interventions could also come from school site professionals. Uh, so, you know, this is the, the more info about that. So involvement law enforcement responses to common child and adolescent behavior contributes to the racial um, inequalities and academic achievement in the school to prison pipeline. So this is why we want to not require schools to have to contact the police so much when there are school-based responses and interventions. Uh, and here we'd actually like to launch our last poll question. And I dropped a link to the fact sheet for AB 610 in, into the chat. Um, and just wanna you know, highlight that, that what, this, what this law actually does is it, it uh, restores discretion and flexibility to educators to decide when law enforcement should be notified. So the, the law currently goes well beyond what federal law requires in terms of, um, in terms of if there's say a gun at the school, that, that the federal law requires um, that the schools notify the police if that happens. But it goes far beyond that, as Amir mentioned, to like if the student is found to possess alcohol or marijuana. And again, you know, as we know, adolescence and teenage years are, are, are a time of learning about your own limits and, and notifying law enforcement isn't necessarily, or probably I would just argue isn't the right response in that situation. And so this allows school administrators to have the flexibility to decide for themselves, do they want to have an alternative response? Um, and so that's why we're interested in this last poll question, um, because we would like to hear from administrators who want that flexibility, because that's going to be really important as we're moving this bill forward in the coming session, um, to have those voices of administrators who are willing to come forward to say, yes, we want this, we want this flexibility, this discretion restored back to us. We're the right ones to make the decisions about for our students. So we do have the results. Um, the question that was launched was, do you know school administrators who would like to have more discretion under the law not to notify law enforcement about student misbehavior in school? And we had 15 votes, 60% said yes, 40% said no. Um, that's, that. yeah, that's great. So if you know of school administrators who would be interested in talking to us and, you know, maybe you know, either, you know, in a, on an anonymous way, basis or, or, you know, non-anonymous, you know, willing to like write up a little paragraph or, you know, provide testimony about why they want that, why they would, why I think they think this bill is important to be passed. Please let us know. I'm going to put in my email address into the chat. Please um, pass it on to school administrators, you know. Yeah, and thank you all for that honesty. We know 40% shows that, you know, not all administrators are on this train for not notifying police, right? And we know there's still some education that has to be done and schools function as an island. For example, I knew, I had one administrator who said every time students got into a fight, he would call the police. And I told him that's not the, the good response. That's not actually going to make them not fight next time. You have to actually restore you know, do restorative justice, transformative justice circles and different things. Uh, so 
the last two slides, we just have links and resources. We talked about a bunch of different reports. So we have links to those reports and we'll share that. I'll share this link as well. And then we also have links to our Youth Liberty Squad if you wanna follow them and keep up with them um, on social media as well. And now we just like to open it up, you know, finally for any more questions or discussions um, about our, our, our thoughts or anything on, the, on this subject. So thank you all for receiving this information. Thank you all for participating in the polls and, and sharing um, critical information. And we'll open it up for any, any other questions. And we're seeing the comments. Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you all. Let me get the link to this presentation and share it. It's not a question, but there seems to be a lot of appreciation and gratefulness um, from the attendees who really, really enjoy this workshop. I personally really enjoy this workshop as well. One of my favorites that I've attended so far. Um, we do have the link in the chat. Um, that's the link for the presentation side. If you're interested in that, you can take a look. Um, Amir, gratefully, uh, graciously uh, put it in the chat for us. Um, and also, I want to mention the survey link I put in the group chat as well. That will help give you points for chances um, to enter our raffle to win um, amazing, amazing um, prizes. But uh, we still have about two more minutes. If there's any last minute questions you would like to ask Amir or Linnea, we'll hold the space. If I see someone asked if we can email this presentation, um, the link as well, and I'll see what we can do about that. So we have a question in the chat. In what ways do you recommend we spread awareness on this issue of no police on schools for violence prevention? Thank you. That's a really important question. You know, down here in, in Southern California, there's a viral video that just happened where the shows the police slamming a, a young person on campus. Um, you know, so I think there's, you know, the Dignity in Schools, California, they, they have information about that as well. And the Fixed School Discipline Coalition, they have a toolkit that actually talks about restorative justice, social emotional learning, and other things. So I'm going to try to find that toolkit right now. But talking about the alternatives, you know, to police, uh, you know, example real life alternatives i know people at the schools and districts want to know well what else should we do you know um how how can we use other school tools for for violence prevention so i'll drop that link to the toolkit in the chat as well yeah um and i just echo everything that amir said and and this is an issue that has as i mentioned before come up with us for us in stockton where you know, there is a relatively, as compared to other areas of California, higher crime rate in the surrounding areas of the schools. And so a lot of times there is this equating police with, with safety, but um, doesn't take into account the harms to the students of the, pol of the police themselves in the schools. And I've been working with um, a wonderful organizer from the Gathering for Justice who has been talking about the need for violence interrupters in the schools and that the, the school district should take those millions of dollars and really um, use programs and alternatives that other schools and areas have used to wonderful effect and have that, that keep students in school instead of pushing them out and making them feel like if they go to school, they're gonna be policed and, and harassed. Thank you for your time today, Amir and Linnea. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, is there any last minute words you would like to say before we close out, anything like that? I would just also say safe passageway or, or um, people who keep safe passageways, for example, would have helped in Long Beach where that fight near school campus led to the officer 
murdering the young person there, if we have safe passageways for students, that's another violence prevention technique. Oh, and I'll lift up that example of what's happening in Louisiana where the fathers are coming in the schools and it, it helped reduce violence. Well, but I'll just say they shouldn't have arrested 23 students for fighting in the first place. But, you know, community-based solutions are there. And they found that they have had no fights since bringing in the fathers and the parents. So tap into that network as well. Yeah, that's a beautiful example. And just many thanks to all of you for being here with us today.